sat in my room at my, my room at my and sister's house and uh, got the sun streaming in through the window. But oh. I've got hay fever. <laughs> oh, right. Good <laughs> morning. It's really hard. So is, I, that, I, uh, I, is that something you've always suffered from? Yeah. yeah. If it was since, since, since my mid 20s, really. Right. Really. No, no. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, the pollen carry goes like, through the roof. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's all good. I don't know. The weather in Sweden has been gorgeous last week. It's like in the 20s, 23 degrees, I think, on Thursday. Oh, right. It was freezing and tipping down with rain here. When I left Sweden to come come over this time, it, it actually snowed. It, there were flurries of snow. Um, that was uh, two weeks ago. I've been over two weeks this time. So, yeah, it's, they, they've hopefully we'll have the same change in the weather here. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. I hope so anyway, hey, um, remind me, whereabouts in Wales are you in South Wales? Yeah, yeah, just outside Cardiff. So oh, it's yeah. twenty minutes on the train to Cardiff from Ponaclean Station, and it, it takes about half an hour to drive. It's much much quicker to go on the train. Um, so is it? Yeah, a, is it a small town or village or? Miskin is um, Miskin is a, a small town just off. Junction 34 of the M4, right? Um, and there's a there's an old medieval church in Miskin, and a its it sister church is in Clantrisant, which is up the road. And Clantrisant is where the Royal Mint is. Um, so some people call Clantrisant the Mint with the Hole. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have um, do you have a weather spoons and a McDonald's? Uh, there's no weather spoons that I know of, but there is a there, there is a McDonald's. Yeah. There's a there's, there's a there's a shopping centre in Polyclean with with the Tesco's, the Sainsbury's open slight, you know, lots right. of retail parks. So it's it's um it's kind of like a it's like a regional shopping hub really. Polyclean it didn't used to be when I was a kid, um, and it, you know it's it, it's uh so it's at the it's at the end. It basically, it's at the beginning of the Rhonda Valley, so it comes a, under R Rhonda, Rhonda Sin and Taff, that is the, the local authority. Yeah. Um, so it's not part of uh, you know Cardiff Council; it, it, it's it's part of the Rhonda. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, it's it's um, between here and Cardiff. You know, there's some really nice places. Like there's a place called Pendoylan, it's where my grandfather's father was born. Um, yeah, so so it's it, it, it's kind of at, at the beginning. It's at the entrance to the Rhonda Valley, and with the border with the Vale of Glamorgan. Right. So Porth Call isn't far away from here, and Porth Call is is you know it's kind of like the Welsh sandbanks. Really, it's very expensive. A place so called Lampwick Major have, um, down that way as well. It's a place you called Carol Bridge. Uh, Twenty mile an hour speed limits. Oh yeah, they've got they they they. they, they all, all of that stuff <laughs> but you know I, I, I don't know what's going to happen with those I mean I've been reading that they might be uh, just un unraveling all of that because yeah, I don't think it's been right. very popular and it wasn't terribly well thought through I don't think. The one thing you know uh, we see you know, is across the country um, the sort of crazy decisions that uh, local councils make in terms of you know, um, cycle lanes. Um, yes, a cycle lane which uh, only lasts for about twelve feet uh, before it merges into the main road. You know, and the cost of doing those sort of things is, you know, you stand, stand back from it, and you know, you wonder whether they've got any brains. Well, yeah, I mean, I it, it's um, I think often. What it is, is is they will introduce something and say, this is why we're introducing this. And it can't possibly be the reason they're introducing it. And if if you sort of then say, well, right, they're introducing this because of something else, which would then be plausible, they would never admit it because what the ends they're trying to achieve are not something that people are actually um, remotely concerned about or likely to, um, well, to give 
democratic legitimacy to. Yeah. And I think there's quite a lot of stuff um, in Welsh policy. Um, so this is Welsh government policy and local authority policy, but it's the same in the UK, uh, in England, it's the same in Scotland, no doubt it'll be the same in Northern Ireland. And this is the, um, the, the central policy unit for, you know, let's just call it the New World Order, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, what it basically is. The central policy unit for that is the United Nations and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And um, things like the 20 mile an hour speed limit are to do with um, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and, and, and um, all the, the stuff about carbon dioxide. I, I, I read an interesting article or a summary of an article by something called Doomberg on Substack about half an hour ago. Yeah. talking about how much carbon dioxide is actually released for burning different stuff and yeah. what he basically says is that the Drax power stations biggest power station in in Britain provides four percent of the electricity for the grid uh, has been converted from coal to burning wood which they import from Canada and, and other places right. um, and he's basically saying that the um, if, it, if you had a, a power station that burnt natural gas, that would be the most sensible thing to do if you give a shit about carbon dioxide. But it's not that. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a really good, I'll send you a link afterwards, but it's, it's a really, you know, it's very short, but it's a very interesting point. And on that point, there's, there's, there's another brilliant book by... Um, uh, someone called Geraldine Perry called um, uh, Climate Land Use Policy and uh, Monetary Policy, the new trifecta. Yeah. And it, it, it's quite, it's, it, it's not a short book, but it's short compared to most of the things in that field. And most people tend to sack, tackle those three headings separately, but she just does this brilliant job in this book, which, which uh, I, I think it came out about 10 years ago. Um, I, 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 I've read it several times. I, I bought a copy. Um, but it, it, like I say, it's a, it is a brilliant book. Um, if you couple that up with the, the Doomberg thing, um, in, in fact, I put a link to it in LinkedIn today. You know, Ivor Cum Cummings, the fat emperor. We, we both yeah. talked about his stuff during the lockdowns and stuff. Um, he posted a video of um, Joe Biden's, the Democratic Party head of Treasury, you know, basically that what, what what would be our chance of the exchequer or whatever. It's slightly different over there. Uh, and the interviewer asked him, why on earth are we basically um, paying interest as a government on money? And, and yeah, right. he ums and ahs and just, you know, he hasn't got a clue. And he sort of he, he settles on. Oh yeah, yeah. The government does kind of print money because we print bonds, and that, I mean it, it, it's just a complete nothing burger of an answer. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I wonder what Andrew Bailey would say. Ask the same question. Yeah. But anyway, that that, that the um, that these questions are being asked asked again at the moment. So twenty mile an hour speed limits is a really good one. So you know. Who remembers being, uh, you know, who remembers anyone saying this vote for me because I'm going to bring in 20 mile an hour limits? No one, because it wasn't on the agenda. It's come it's come from from outside. It's come from somewhere. And then the question is where? And so that's when you look at, say, things like the mayoral elections and there's a parliament of mayors that, um, that there are all sorts of transnational um, organisations that people like Sadiq Khan belong to or and Andy Burnham who's the Manchester mayor mm. um, and this this idea of um, having powerful mayors um, but those powerful mayors they're not answerable to the national legislature they are answerable to the sustainable development goals ultimately the 
you know, that's that's the UN, the World Health Organization. And, 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 and basically, they're all the Rockefeller institutions, you know, so the Rockefellers, the Trilateral Commission, whatever, they, they set these places up, uh, set, set these things up, Council on Foreign Relations, um, uh, the, you know, the Tavistock Group, Chatham House, all of the, the think tanks and foundations and all this sort of thing. And the level of um, the, the level of understanding of what those things actually are now um, has kind of got to the point where I would say in, in the late 70s, um, there was a lot more material about these sorts of things with people like, um, oh, what's he called, Sutton, Anthony Sutton. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of stuff on videotape which has found its way onto the digital internet now, but is kind of room one o one on on the internet. Right. But a lot of it is starting to resurface. You know, not least because people like me download it off the way back machine and, and put it up. Um, but you know that that, that there's um, the the other one is uh, Colonel Prouty. Um, a, a ton of stuff has just been appearing recently, and again. Um, you know, people have been recovering it from the way back machine and putting it back into I, these things. They don't last long on YouTube, but they don't get a wide airing because of the algorithms. But on things like Rumble, BitChute or some of the. Um, some of the less. Heavily censored channels if you like they, they kind of you know um the, the information is out there the yeah. books you know you can find the books you won't get them in a bookshop because they're out of print but the way back machine i get lots of books off the way back machine and if they're not on on that's the internet archive and if they're not on there i, I use a thing called libgen which is a pirate book site um mm. which is basically hosted in russia um and uh so for instance, uh, Prouty's book, um, which came out in the 70s, I saw an interview the other day. It was someone interviewing about um, about this book he'd written. I, I just downloaded it and read it from from Libgen. I, I, wait, you know, wait, wait, uh, to interrupt you, when you say Wayback Machine, I use uh, archive.ph. Is, is that the same archive today? Uh, the web archive or the internet archive is it has been going for i think it was set up around 2000 so it's been going for nearly no, no, my, a century. No, my question was is wayback machine is that the same as archive today or different no i don't think it is it, 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 it's called the internet archive and it's got a thing called the wayback machine and it has books it has television programs. It has videos from okay, YouTube. Fine. Would you would you send me a link to that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 And and so if, if you find a broken link on the internet, right? So you know, not found or page doesn't exist, you can put it in the internet way back machine, and it will basically show where where it's been stored, and. Right. Um, if you click on the earliest, you know, the, the blue dots, if you click on those, you'll actually get the web page. Right. There's, there's things called web scrapers, which, which, which um, it, so it uses basically a web scraper. Um, and and, and uh, it's got, it's not a complete record of the internet going back to 2000, but it's it, it's a pretty comprehensive right. um, record of quite would a you, lot of uh, stuff. Would you send that by uh, email? Uh, not yeah. By yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll send it by email after. Because I, um, I, you know, I uh, never look at Skype unless uh, unless I'm making a call or receiving oh, a call. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll send I'll it an send email, email after. Yeah, great. Right. Yeah. Effectively, <laughs> what it's like, it's like someone giving you the keys to room 101. Yeah, 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 yeah no. Um, I, I yeah. So what about the uh, the local elections, um, a bloodbath for... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I... I do you know the, the thing about the local elections that stands out to me more than anything uh, and there was an article on sky news overnight and that's the number of independents that have been returned 
So independent councillors uh, have basically done better than uh, the Green Party, than um, the Reform Party or anyone else. The BBC is lumping the 16% as others, right? But right. of that, about half of that 16% is actually independent candidates. Oh, and um, so the wiki that I built, wiki, wiki ballot, wiki, wiki tactical voting. Um, Andrew Bridgen is standing as a independent. His 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 his, his constituency is North Leicestershire, isn't it? Okay. Um, and he gave a interview outside Parliament after his speech on the uh, vaccine harms debate that that, yeah. that he got. Um, and he was talking about, right, these days, he said, you can either vote for an MP who will represent a political party in Parliament, or you can vote for an MP that will vote represent you in Parliament. Therefore, you need to vote for an independent MP that will represent you in Parliament. That's the whole point about wiki tactical voting. Now, the other party that's standing um, and I think they probably had a few standing in the local, but they're really going for the national politics, is George Galloway's Workers' Party. Um, yeah. Now, their launch the other day, I watched it live, and he was essentially saying the same thing. They, they, they won't stand candidates against genuine independence. Whether they'll stand one against Andrew Bridgen in North Leicestershire is an interesting question. Uh, but, for instance, they said they if Jeremy Corbyn stands in Islington, Islington North, I think he's Islington North as well, um, uh, they wouldn't stand against him. Um, and I th the other point that Bridgen made, um, actually, you know, George Galloway made, is, is that 80% of um, Conservative MPs are members of Conservative Friends of Israel. I think it's 40% of Labour MPs are members of uh, Labour Friends of Israel. Uh, and, and basically what, what he's saying is that why would an external uh, affiliation be of any interest to a national parliament? Why? Why would you need to have that? And the same thing applies to why would a political candidate's affiliation to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or these supranational policies, why, why should that be of any interest to... A, a national parliament and of course the answer is well um it's a difficult one to answer that you know yeah. i mean in terms of foreign policy um you can see you want you, you obviously you want a forum for diplomacy and where people would discuss um foreign relations um but foreign relations and domestic policy sovereign domestic policy you know they're different things um and and uh actually saying a one size fits all that you know uh worldwide policy is is anything that can be remotely workable is ridiculous yeah. you know, and that that then goes back to this Doomberg argument about you know um <clears throat> meeting these c o two targets through twenty mile an hour speed limits or um you know basically not burning the most efficient energy sources that we have you know what on earth would you do that what, what why is that well the answer to why that is is in the um uh geraldine perry book i said about um and and, and you know it's basically a carbon-based currency it, it's co2 yeah. trading and cap and trade and all of that stuff which has had more rebrandings and um <laughs> it, it's it's you know so many different things it's called because basically when people twig well actually i don't think that's in my interest i'm not really in favor of that they change the name call it something else you know which so it, we're just uh, i think we're at a really interesting point mike I, I i i my whole sense is that people realize that that um the stagnation is in someone's interest someone is trying to preserve their slice of the pie uh, and this is the, you know, elite oligarch class and, you know, all their, their hangers on. So, you know, at the, you know it, it, it's the one percent rallying around the point naught one percent or the billionaire class. 
and it's not in anyone else's interest to uh, you know, have them kind of living the life of Riley at the expense of everybody else. You know, that it's unearned wealth, you know, much of it is inherited. Most of it is is pilfered uh, through monopolistic predatory business practices, um, which is in which is endorsed by the UN, the World Health Organization and these supranational bodies. But also we've got a whole bunch of professional politicians who have been trained um, in that that worldview, which yeah. is a worldview which is anti-human, anti-nation state, and anti-democratic. And they call they call democracy populism. Well, actually, you know, one person, one vote, um, and, and, a, and, a, and a full airing of all the issues, an honest airing of all the issues, you know, that's not populism, that, that, that's basically, uh, you know, a fair shake. Uh, uh, and I, I don't remember a time, you know, um, since I've been paying attention to these things, you know, I mean, you and I have been talking about these things for the last whatever it is, uh, 15 yeah. years now, I guess. Long time. <laughs> it's a pretty long time. We've known each other for over 30 odd years. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the the. The current level of um, awareness that hold on a second there's something up here something 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 here isn't smelling right right now I don't remember um, I don't remember such a widespread holding of the nose going on you know if that makes well, sense I think um, I think it's fair to say that that, that increased awareness is as a result of uh, people now seeing uh, what was really going on in the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, I think that's, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. Right. What's uh, what I found was disgraceful was that um, I watched uh, a couple of minutes of uh, the Andrew Bridgman uh, presentation in Parliament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was less than a dozen MPs present. Yeah. Right. And he's talking about excess deaths, unexplained deaths of uh, uh, you know the uh, the people. And I don't know how many MPs there are. Is there, there's six hundred or more? Yeah. Yeah and only a dozen people pitched up and the reason for that is that um, you know uh, well we know that uh, prospective MPs say what they think they have to say to get elected and when they get elected uh, they're part of uh, a party and they want to follow the party line a party uh, follow the orthodox uh, 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 view because their objective is is themselves to yeah, try yeah. and uh, and improve their situation by maybe getting some sort of uh, uh, towards some sort of ministerial uh, post or, or whatever their objective might be, and they yeah, and they will not uh, even though they in their own uh, in their own hearts some uh, will know that. Uh, things are not right, but they will not put their head by the parapet because they know they will be punished, punished by their party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've all been penetrated by Klaus Schwab. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he said, oh, we have penetrated most of the cabinets in the world. <laughs> you know, if you uh, listen to Klaus Schwab, and you know nothing about him, right? And you're uh, an average Joe on the street, and not somebody like ourselves, who um, you know became aware of uh, the shit show that is going on, you know, ten, fifteen years ago or more. Uh, if you're an average Joe listening to Clash Wob, you think, 
that guy is weird. Yeah. Where does he come up with all that uh, uh, all that crap? And then uh, if he's a sidekick, uh, Yuval uh, yeah. Harari, or whatever he's called, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's on another planet. I mean, the sort of things he says where uh, yeah, the day of, uh, the time of um, having choice uh, will be gone. Mm. Uh uh, uh, yeah, they, 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 they basically say that there's no such thing as free will, don't they? And they try and justify that scientifically. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we're all just cogs in their machine, you know. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, talking about transhumanism, you know, uh, where uh, we, it's, um, it's a bit like uh, they're, they're proposing that... Um, Remember in Star Trek, the Borg? Mm hmm. Right, and the Borg are uh, uh, individuals who are pro programmed uh, by the, uh, into uh, a, you know, sort of a central, uh, you know, where they all operate according to the, uh, the central uh, control. Um, and um, and you know, that's what they're proposing that uh, you know everybody is programmed um, so that uh, what they do and how they do it is controlled centrally. Yeah, right. Which which in reality is uh, a development uh, one step further uh, to the idea of communism. Yeah, communism, fascism, call it or totalitarianism. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what's the yeah. other one? Feudalism. I mean, I, you know, feudalism. Yeah. Uh, Puritanism. There are all sorts of um, uh, things from the past that have been uh, discredited, and 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 most people don't think, you know, deserve a rerun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, they, you know. They, 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 they seem to be for it and of course the reason we're not for it is because we're all too thick <laughs> yeah we don't know what's good for us it, you know and it, it's kind of ever thus wasn't it i tell you um i watched last night um what's he called now piers morgan does a show called uncensored and last night he, he interviewed some uh some some scientist bloke uh who's written a book about um about intelligent design in the universe and what have you so he's on the other side of the argument from uh richard dawkins anyway it's a really good interview um and you know this, this guy's he basically says yeah there is free will right. um, you know and, and uh uh you know human beings clearly um you know can make choices so, you, you know you know me i'm into my pelag pelagius yeah. um so you know, I I take Pelagius's arguments over Saint Augustine, um, and um, Saint Augustine had a sort of a limited view of what free will actually was, um, mainly because uh, if if you have absolutely no free will, then you can't have punishment because you know <laughs> if people haven't got free will, you can't hold them accountable for what they do, can you? Uh, so. <coughs> <laughs> there are degrees of the argument, but Pelagius um, was not well liked by uh, St. Augustine. Um, and of course, so much of this stuff, as we've talked about in the past, goes back to, um, you know, the split between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and and you know, I, I, I've banged on in the past about the, the, the split between Shia and Sunni Islam. Uh, but, you know, there are also similar splits in, 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 in doctrine in, in the Jewish church. Um, and, and uh, you know, um, I, I did a long blog the other day about Jesus throwing the money changers out of the temple and what, what all that's about. 
and about you know Jewish laws of jubilee and what have you. Uh, so basically, the orthodox Abrahamic view, uh, and and um, uh, its injunction against usury, um, and uh, again, I think these are, I think we're dangerously close to having those on the agenda now. So, like the Ivor Cummings thing, this person asking Biden's economics person, you know. How does it make any sense that a government should borrow money and pay interest on it? You know, if if the government is printing the money, why would they do that? What's that all about? And of course, the, it, it isn't. You know, the bondholders, um, you know, it's, it's interdependency between governments at one level. But really, ultimately, most of the interest goes to the corporate part of banking. Yeah. Not, uh, and, and that. The, the current drive towards central bank digital currencies is actually to um, get rid of smaller banks that have some degree of independence doing what people think banks do but don't actually do, i.e. Um, uh, hold earned funds from other people and lend them out, you know, a lending model of banking, whatever. Uh, that's the, the C central bank digital currencies thing is going even further towards um uh basically putting banking above the law and which yeah. is, you know which basically has been for a long time um and and uh uh having a, this the, the totalitarian is, uh, the, um, the, yeah we 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 both understand the issues but the thing is that the majority of, of the population has no idea what's going on in banking in terms of fractionalized reserve uh, uh, banking, etc., etc. I I just pulled up uh, a, a quote. I I sort of you know uh, when I see a, a, a quote that sort of resonates with my thinking, I sort of uh, uh, make a note of it. Anyway, this one is from Aldous Huxley. I think has uh, some. Uh, uh, has some merit. He says that uh, the greater part of the population is not very intelligent. Dread responsibility and desires nothing better than to be told what to do. Providing the rulers do not interfere with their material comforts and their cherished beliefs, he is perfectly happy to let himself be ruled. I think there is some truth to that. Well, well I, I think that's a think very elitist construction on the argument. Um, um, so it probably doesn't surprise you to know that I don't agree. <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 well, it has an it, element of truth. Well, taking it bit by bit, the greater part of the population is not very intelligent. Agree or disagree? It depends how you define in, in intelligence. Um, so, you know, a certain type of intelligence, yes, but is the greater part of the public stupid or stupid um, as opposed to no, 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 no. What, he's saying, what he's saying is having a brain that allows you to appreciate and understand uh, uh, fairly basic uh, concepts, and that's saying that if you if you went down to uh, uh, a local village pub and you started talking about fractionalised uh, reserve banking, right? It would just go over the head of, of the majority of people. Yeah, yeah. So including, including including people that Huxley would class as intelligent, and possibly even including himself, because it's a it, it's a pretty cork sniffy area. Um, I'm mean, like most people in the world don't know as much about it as I do. I know that, but I don't think that makes me more intelligent than them, or even superior to them. Uh. And it says uh, dreads of responsibility. Well, 
again, um, people are interested in their own interests and um, taking responsibility for a overclass or something. You know, how many people are prepared to collaborate with the enemy, as it were? You know, you can turn that around. So a as a general statement, what Huxley is saying there to me is elitist. He wrote um, Brave New World, so we all know what he really is about. Um, I, I would I wonder what uh, uh, maybe uh, yes. yeah I wonder if I if I had not uh, told you where the quote came from whether well, I, well, I would know no, you've told me before we've talked about it before are we all oh, right all right yeah. okay well let's agree to disagree on that what about uh, Sadiq Khan do you think he will sneak past the post well, I was amazed he got in when, when he was last raised in during all the lockdowns and what have you. Yeah, you've got a you've question. Got a question. I, I'm not in London, so I haven't seen any of the um, propaganda or whatever they call any of the canvassing or anything like that. I've, I've, I really haven't paid attention. But I. I I would be very surprised if he doesn't get in again. Do I think that's good for London? No, I don't. Um, I think that he, who was it got himself into trouble? It was some Tory MP, didn't he get drummed out of the brownies? Was sort of, oh yeah, it was Lee Anderson, wasn't it? Sort of saying that that um, needed to get control back of London. You know, he didn't mean from from the Muslims or something like that. Uh, but Sadiq Khan is part of this parliament of mayors, same as Andy Burnham. They're, they're not batting for the national team. They're, they're just not. They're, they're um, you know, they, they are promoting a globalist agenda, which is against the interests of most ordinary people worldwide, wherever they are. Whose interests is it in the interests of? It's in the interests of the global corporate class and the corporate monopoly class. Um, and the global so-called elite, uh, who, who are nothing of the sort. I mean, uh, we're in a new gilded age of um, uh, uh, w which isn't creating more wealth. It, it, it's basically despoiling um, and, 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 and ransacking what's left of, that isn't already owned by these parasites. That's that's my view. So who, who, who does Sadi Khan represent? It's not the people. He represents the parasites, and the parasites, with their current set of policies, are in are killing the wealth creating host, which right. is the general body of, you know, human consciousness melded together with resources and but all of that you, sort of thing. Yeah, I understand all that. We both had that all the all the detail, but. Uh, I ask myself, what is it that makes people vote for Sadiq Khan? Well, I don't know what the turnout is, Mike, for a London mayoral election. It'd be interesting to see what it is. I was talking to my sister the other day about this. She sort of said, if, if no one votes, do they have to do the vote again? And I said, well, no, they don't. But the legitimacy of the election would be less. So we, we had a discussion about, is it better not to vote at all? Or would it be better to vote for an independent and return a parliament that's got enough independence to make a difference? Um, I, and I'm of that later latter persuasion. You know, I, I don't think... The, the, I think it'll be a gradual process, but I think, you know, I've been saying we've got to basically um, reoccupy the establishment. You know, yeah, I, I don't claim yeah, to be anything well, other than an establishment well, well, person. Well, you're you know. not answering the question. You know, uh, Sadiq Khan is coming up to uh, securing his third term. What is it that makes people vote for Sadiq Khan? Looking at what's going on in terms of, I I've no idea, Mike. And and I mean, his predecessor was Boris Johnson, and before Boris Johnson, you had Ken Livingstone, you know, who was 
kind of uh, Ken Livingstone was the first mayor of London, wasn't he? When yeah. um, when they introduced the mayor alty, and then it was Boris Johnson, and then it was said. So, so he's only the third one, um, and the um, London at the local level is mostly um, Labour voters. Now, um, the fact that New Labour, or you know, certainly uh, the Labour which um, Keir Starmer votes for, the Blairite Labour, has got nothing to do with the Labour Party. You know, it's not. It, it's you know, uh, George uh, uh, George Galloway calls it, you know the Uni parties the two cheeks of the same ass. Yeah. So. Um, in voting for Sadiq Khan, I think people in ignorance are voting for him, thinking it's representing something else, when they're actually voting against their own interests yeah. in returning Sadiq Khan. But it's the same in Bristol as well with Marvin Rees. You know, he, he's of the same globalist persuasions. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it's they are basically fascists. It's, it's corporate state monopoly capitalism. Um, you know, they don't have a problem with corporate monopolies um, yeah. and they expect the people to shut up and do as they're told. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a mystery. But, uh, Ross, uh, going back to the point you were making about uh, St. Augustine and uh, the temple and, uh, you know, clear, uh, Jesus clearing out the temple. I mean, firstly, um, there are many interpretations of the Bible out there. It's a very complex text. Um, but and I'm not, not trying to be clever or put you on the spot, but um, uh, your view was that uh, uh, the cleansing of the temple is about usury. Uh, can I ask you, to emphasize not being trying to be clever, but why were the money changers in the temple? Right. Well, the, the, the money changers, OK, uh, basically provided the Tyrian shekel, which was the Roman uh, currency, to people traveling to the, the uh, temple to give their, their, their offerings. And the offerings, uh, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, whatever, the, 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 the Jewish priest class, decreed that those offerings had to be given in the Roman currency and the money changers charged basically an extortionate exchange rate and, and people through their religious beliefs had to make these offerings and that's what Jesus was complaining about the the the, the usurious exchange rates because people weren't borrowing the money they were they were changing one currency to another currency my understanding is different. Firstly, um, the um, temple is Jewish. That's right. And one principle of, Ju uh, of Judaic uh, uh, tem uh, temple is that you cannot have icons, including... You I'm sorry, say again, Mike didn't hear that. You cannot have any icons right including uh using currency which has uh the iconic figure of uh an emperor okay yeah what my understanding what was going on was this that the temple had its own currency which was known as half a silver shekel and it was uh, 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 a coin uh, without any um, any iconic uh, figure on it, okay, mm -hmm. and therefore was complying with uh, uh, the Jewish religion rules. And therefore, to when you uh, entered the uh, temple, you firstly had to have uh, a ritual cleansing bath which cost money, 
and then to get into the temple proper, you have to have uh, you have to have uh, make a payment. And because the the arrangement of the temple was that, and it was uh, you know, the temple was huge, built by uh, uh, King Herod. Well, he expanded uh, uh, the old second temple. Right. Um, and it comprised uh, a huge ground floor area which was used for trading. Because equally, um, it was a, a major trading point where uh, people knew that uh, there would be lots of people there from different areas because it was um, uh, uh, a religious, a Jewish religious rule that every observant Jew should visit the uh, temple at least three times a year. And the most popular visit was for the uh, Passover, of course. <coughs> and so the money traders, the deal was that the uh, money traders um, exchanged whatever currency people brought with them for the temple half a shekel so that it gave them the opportunity or the means to be able to go in and uh, do their worship, whatever. Okay. At the end of the day, uh, what you then had is uh, uh, the money changers uh, no longer, if they are very good days, shall we say, you know, take the extreme, they no longer had half a uh, any half shekels because all of that was uh, uh, now in the possession of the uh, priestly class. So at the end of the day, uh, the money traders would meet up with the, uh, the priests and they would buy back the half shekels so that they could start their business again the following day. So that the priests ended up with uh, you know, uh, this uh, wide variety of currency, which they, uh, which they then used as various channels uh, that they used to convert it into uh, money, money uh, uh, that they could use. Okay. So what you're looking at was uh, uh, a transfer of, uh, of wealth uh, shared between the money exchanges and the priestly class. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and the um, the exchange rate used benefit both the priestly class and um, and the money changers because the uh, the worse the exchange rate, uh, the wealthier the uh, money changers and the priestly class became. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, and they they were basically exploit, exploiting the religious devotion of of, of 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 people that, and that's what that's what pissed Jesus off. More than more than that, uh, uh, well, you're saying that, that that also the temple coin didn't have an icon on it. Well, I mean that that's render unto Caesar. That is that that's when Jesus sort of answering shall we pay the roman taxes and he said render unto caesar what well, that's which is caesar's that's talking about the picture on the coin that if it's you know a tax etc but that's a different question to actually the exchange rate scam which the priests were in on well, um, along with the money changes which, which effectively was under was under the uh the, the roman occupation so Herod, for instance, and the priestly caste were basically collaborating with an imperial Roman occupying force. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But the other aspect was that um, what scholars say is that um, uh, Jesus did not agree with the idea that you should have uh, the temple as a trading post. You know, uh, people uh, 
bringing along their wares uh, yeah. and uh, as a huge area uh, uh, before the temple proper. Uh, it, was, uh, it was market stalls. Yeah, the, the niceties of the arguments around usury, which isn't just charging an exorbitant rate of interest, you know, um, exchange rates come under it too. Yeah. Um, and the exploitation of uh, money in an economy. So this is the, the idea of sovereign money, the money of the people, etc. Um, clearly, the Catholic Church, who surrendered to usury, um, you know, basically forgot their te- the, the, the ancient teachings on usury for their own political ends, you know, um, uh, which has got nothing to do with religious devotion. It's all business. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's hardly surprising that Jesus's objection to the money changers. Remember, money changers, not money lenders, um, are is is not well understood and it's not in the interests of the current monetary class. So the. These are the financial overlords of the, you know, the new world order, let's call it that. Um, it's not in the interest of the Catholic Church until it actually gets back. And this is what um, basically uh, Jesus wanted to go back to the Abrahamic laws. He wanted to go back to the Jewish laws, which covered such matters as usury. Um, you know, the, the, the point you make about not having icons on the coin uh, that that's not something that, you know, um, uh, I'll have to go and have another look at that because that's that's a new twist on it. But the meat of it, the, the meat of uh, what learning um, that Jesus was actually given um, in, in that, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's in most of the Gospels, isn't it? They all talk about it. I think Josephus talks about it as well. Um, and he, he's a historian, not, not a religious uh, thing, his, his, his writings. So the contemporaneous accounts of the life of Jesus are found in Josephus, and that's nothing to do with the Bible. Um, Just to interrupt you there, uh, Josephus. Pardon? Uh, just to interrupt you, Josephus, right, does, does not report any of the Jesus events. Oh, he reports on the Jewish revolts. Yeah, but not anything about Jesus. And, and clearly, what? Jesus was a big part of all of that. And that's by inference. There's nothing in the uh, Josephus books that he wrote 20 books which records anything that is recorded in the uh, New Testament about Jesus. Uh, there is only one reference. Uh, I'm, I'm not Jesus. sure that. Yes. Believe me, Rod. I've uh, spent many hours listening to uh, biblical scholars. There's only one reference in Josephus, uh, which could be said to be about uh, the existence of Jesus. As as it's called, um, it's in his uh, book 19, and it's called uh, uh, Testimonium Flavium. And where it uh, refers to uh, somebody called Jesus, who is also referred to as Christos, the Christ. And there's huge debate amongst um, uh, biblical scholars as to how much of that is actually original, original or uh, whether it was altered by Christians mm. yeah. uh, in later years to try and provide at least some backstory for Jesus. Yeah. The well, only, uh, the well, only I, other... I, I, I'm not a scholar of Josephus, so I can't say. I, I haven't read Book 19 or indeed any of the other 50 books or however many there are. Um, and, 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 and I assume they were written in Latin as well, and I can't read Latin, so... Um, uh, so, 
so with the passage of time and the vagaries of translations and all the rest of it, I'm sure there's quite a lot of debate that goes on. Um, but uh, and the same thing can be levelled at the the uh, the Gospels, of course. Um, but my my reading of the Gospels and readings of writings about the Gospels. Okay. Um, there's a website in New Zealand called King Watch. Um, I think it's written by a New Zealand priest. Uh, and, and he basically is called, uh, there's a chapter in the website called Jesus and the Economic Law, which covers some of this stuff. Other stuff about the Turian shekel and all the rest of it, I've, I've read elsewhere in things like um, the lost science of money um, and, and uh, uh, Del Mar's book and thing you know so that there's there are lots of little bits that you have to piece together um but uh in in I mean, and it's a long time that i got that I, I i i did most of my reading on usury and the religious debate of, about you usury um god i i must be 12, 13 years ago now. So um, the the general gist of it, um, so the the understanding that I and construction I put on onto it is kind of is is very loaded with my bias about the current monetary system and what I think is wrong with the current monetary system. Yeah, 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 cool. uh, so, so, I mean, the Michael Journal will have lots of stuff on there. So that's an anti-usury Catholic Canadian organisation. And I, I, I read most of the stuff that they put out, you know, 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, and, you know, you take away bits and pieces, don't you? But I, like I, I'm I'm not I'm not an expert on either the Gospels or the um, or the religious debates around usury. Uh, uh, my takeaways from what I have studied of that do, though, inform the different angles that I look at the existing system and what I think is wrong with the existing monetary system. And it's the existing monetary system now, which uh, which I think um, could do with another good airing, because um, yeah, uh, I agree. The point I was making, Roger, is that um, uh, when you refer to uh, a, a biblical story, right, there are many interpretations of uh, uh, individual stories, and to my mind. Um, the first thing you've got to ask is, to what extent can I uh, rely upon uh, the Bible as being credible, truthful, historical? Or could it be that much of what's in the Bible, particularly the New Testament, is it uh, stories constructed in order to support an individual or a group of people's thinking as to how uh, things should be at the time it was written? And therefore, was, was it the case that kernels of factual history were expanded, embellished, added to in order to promote those ideas well i i think that's undoubtedly the the case um i mean with with the old testament it's slightly different because it comes from an oral tradition and you know the custodians of an oral tradition i like you know i, I mean greek philosophy was handed down through an oral tradition and then got written down and obviously then that 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 once things get written down or when they're repeated in an oral tradition, it, it's, of course, it's like Chinese whispers, isn't it, at best. Um, so taking all that as, yeah, sure, you know, I wouldn't argue against that. Yeah. Um, 
And but also, that's, they, 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 that's where scholarship comes in, isn't it? And and then you ha you have to do your own research, think about what it is that's in there, and triangulate to, you know, if it's if 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 it's truth that you're after, uh, that that involves you know that that involves some thinking, sadly. <laughs> Yeah, well, I like most things. But <laughs> it's an addition from today, Roger. You know, uh, you read the papers, listen to the news, which uh, I don't uh, listen to the news on TV. But if you do, you hear something. But you have to ask a question. Is that the truth or the entire truth? Or is that got a, an agenda there? Yeah, I I, I think that's right. Um... But came back again. Because I, I've looked into this uh, quite a lot over the years, uh, listening to uh, the views of biblical uh, scholars. And you know, there are those out there, when I talk about biblical scholars, they haven't got it yet. You know, they, um, well, the majority haven't. You know, they are, many uh, of these people, uh, Bart Erdman, uh, Dr. Price, uh, you know, there are many other, you know, they spent their lifetime analysing uh, the Bible, uh, comparing it to uh, uh, documents outside of the Bible, uh, looking for, well, how does that fit into what was really going on in the society at the time? That the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the biblical story relates to, and um, you know they uh, you know they really put you under the microscope, and uh, so I you know I I look at I listen to a lot of uh, uh, those discussions, and uh, you know learn more about the uncertainties of the detail in both the uh, Old and the New Testament. Going back to what you were saying about St. Augustine, okay. Uh, he ended up as the uh, Bishop of uh, Hippo, which is uh, North Africa, somewhere, I think Tunisia. But he, he started off life as uh, the son of um, a very uh, extremely wealthy family. And yeah. um, uh, have you read the confessions? Saint no, Augustine's no. confessions, because I've, I've, I've actually read them. They're quite quite interesting. Quite quite a ripping yarn, really. Yeah, you know. So he was uh, in his early life. Was, uh, he was a very intelligent guy, but was very much, uh, you know, wine, women, and song for a long period. And some say that. Uh, in his uh, after his uh, his conversion, you know, he became obsessed with purity, obsessed with the sin, and it was um, it was Augustine who brought to the forefront uh, the idea of original sin, right? But if you then, uh, not my idea, you know, uh, something was pointed out by one of these biblical scholars, okay? If you go back to the Old Testament and, uh, you know, uh, how Augustine says, well, original sin was, uh, you know, eating the uh, fruit from the tree of knowledge, okay? And uh, that, uh, that then is uh, all part of uh, humanity, everybody is born with original sin, etc. But if you go back and stand apart from and look at the, the story, Adam and Eve in the garden, and they could do what they want, but the one thing they're not supposed to do is to eat from the uh, tree of knowledge. <coughs> right? There's no apple. The apple was a, a later, uh, uh, you know, uh, story. Uh, to make it uh, look easier for uh, inclusion in uh, in school textbooks, okay. So anyway, so Adam and Eve are not allowed to eat the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge, right? Uh, if they eat from the tree of knowledge, they will then gain uh, 
the knowledge of good and bad, right and wrong, OK? And so the argument runs, how can they have sinned by eating from the tree of knowledge if they didn't know what was right or wrong, that they didn't know what was uh, good and evil? So how could they have, uh, how could they have uh, committed the original sin? Yeah, well, that's if a similar they, question to free will, isn't it? And if, if there is no, if, 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 if people don't have free will, how can you fun, punish them in the same way that if they don't know what right or wrong is? It, you know, it's a, it's a similar sort of binary, isn't it? Um, my... Uh, my approach to the Bible is that it's another philosophical text text. And so, for instance, um, the same way I approach Roman philosophy or so, Greek yeah, philosophy, no, or I'm I, philosophy if no, you like, I'm, I'm is, is, is in the same the same way. And so it's sort of a, as an ethical guide or an ethical guidebook so what, and then look it, for archetypes right, across. No, I, I understand that, but what's, what is the theological ethical guide uh, in the uh, story of the uh, true knowledge? Well, I, I think that's where I, I tend not to get bogged down in the ecclesiastical niceties or the theological um, sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the canonical sort of you know what, what the church says i don't give a shit what the church says because my particular faith is a personal relationship between me and god okay and i wouldn't interfere with other people so so it, it's basically between me and my conscience no, I and I, all that, but what's the point of that story well what's the point of any story mike I mean, you know, we, 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 we try to explain concept through stories. So um, so so I, I would point everybody. Obviously, it doesn't apply to the New Testament, but it does apply to the Old Testament to my and, and and his guide for the complex for the perplexed. So different stories are written to be read at different levels yeah. and mean different things as one att attains a broader understanding of different issues. And. Um, it's resolving contradictions in in life and making ethical choices or making moral choices. Right. Okay. That, 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 um, that will sit well with our own right. well being. Right. There are times when you talk too much, <laughs> <laughs> and you know. You well, you said you said what's the point of the story, and yeah. I'm saying well. You know, there are. Yeah, but simply, what you're saying is the point of the story is how uh, individuals interpret it. And there are very many different interpretations. But anyway, let's see that side, right? One uh, further, I think, common sense uh, question for you, right? Let's take it for granted that we have a creator God, OK? And so the uh, creator God uh, creates the entire universe. In terms of the scale of the universe, it's very difficult to comprehend. The best um, sort of um, example towards comprehension I, I've heard is that uh, if you were able to collect together all of the sand on all the all of the uh, uh, beaches, all of the deserts, all the sand under the sea, all the sand under the earth, and put it into one humongous uh, uh, pile somewhere, right? totally illusory but so you have this huge pile if you then approach that pile and you take out one grain of that sand the remaining grains 
in a humongous pile would not be sufficient. And in that grain of sight, you hold your finger, you say, this represents Earth. The remaining grains in that humongous uh, pile would not be sufficient to describe the number of planets in the universe. Okay. So, anyway. So, uh, God uh, creates uh, the universe. And as part of, the, part of that uh, huge endeavor, he creates Earth what we call Earth. And on Earth, he creates everything we know about. Seas, mountains, uh, uh, flora, insects, animals. And the, the highest being he creates is the human being. Okay. Now, at this point, uh, it seems to me God has an option. It's, you can either say, well, I want the human beings to behave in a certain way. Or alternatively, God says, well, no, I don't want uh, human beings to behave in a certain way. Uh, let them get on and do what they want without any direction of me. Okay. Now, religions and the whole variety of religions say that they know uh, what God expects us to do. So if he uh, won those options, if uh, he decided that uh, he didn't want to direct how humans behave in any way, that would then make all religion uh, redundant and, and uh, untruthful. Right? If God decided that he did want people to behave in a certain way, the most obvious route would be that he would hardwire hard it into the brain of the human being in the same way uh, that we have instinct to do or not to do certain things, right? And if he decided that he wanted human beings to operate in a certain way, wouldn't he make sure they did so? When you look at the outcome, uh, you have a huge variety of religions telling us very different things in terms of what God expects. There are several distinctions that, that I would make before sort of getting into a discussion of all the the points embedded in, you know, the, the simple form of that argument that you're making is, is that um, uh, you know, the problem of good and evil and wickedness no, in the world no, and all the rest no, of it and, and, and why. No, it's got nothing to do with good and evil. I'm talking about what is the intent of God? Well, the intent, well, it's unknowable, isn't it? And, and that, that's why, why people will talk about it till the cows come home, because it's, it, it's to so, do with faith. No, uh, right, uh, a bit. bit by bit. If it is unknowable, all religions are invalid. I, well... I, I, as a general statement, Mike, you know, what is religion? Are we talking about the church, churches, organised religion, sex, and we're cults, talking, uh, no, no, you know, so organisations of people that call themselves a religion or, or call themselves the true religion or whatever, right? It's that, it's religion. The, the question of, of faith no, 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 no. And, and a moral compass, don't get, try and get I, I don't think has to be attached to religions as put forward as, well, churches, religion or whatever. 
you know, human consciousness is a, it, it is the broadest possible church. And that's... Lord, Lord stop, stop, stop. Uh, Christianity, uh, Islam, the Judaic religion, Hindu, right? They all promote the idea that we know what God wants us to do. Well, I, 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 my argument's much more simple than that. My argument for God and for human consciousness it doesn't need a church, it doesn't need religion. What it, what, all it needs is a simple sense of right and wrong. No, and conscience no, no, as well as conscious. Stop it, stop it. We're not talking about God, we're talking about the religious institutes. I'm saying. Yeah, well, I, I, and what I'm saying is that I, I don't believe that religious institutions are particularly godly. I, uh, that's not where I'm coming from. Right. So, in your view, because the religious institutes uh, promote that they uh, know what God wants, what you are saying is that they cannot know what God wants and therefore they are invalid. I consider them to be political more than religious in their motivation and the more organised they become, the more political they become. So they And so I, I, I think so they are invalid. Well, I, I, I think they can't be trusted and they make invalid claims about talking for God, because I don't think anyone, anyone in, intervenes between a sentient being and their relationship with the consciousness or God consciousness. So, because religious institutions either promote an idea that they know what God wants, well, it, they're not. It's not mutually exclusive. I'm not saying that they that, that they can't be godly or have a connection with that. It, I think it's an illegitimate claim for anyone to make that it is only through them that one can become to know God consciousness. Right. But all religions, whether it's the ones I set out, say that they know what, how God wants uh, you to behave and what you should do, what you shouldn't do, is invalid. Well, all, all is a very big word. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't even know what all religions are, right? But what I would say is that um, there's a very um, Robert Graves the poet okay does an interview um, where he talks about faith and the difference between the ecclesiasticals and a a relationship with the Bible and Bible stories and what they mean and, and what he basically says is that the um, the provocation of thinking about these things, okay, it, it's um, that's the uh, that there, 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 there's something to be channeled but actually delegating that channeling to a church or to a cleric or to an ecclesiastical body is an unwise thing to do for someone that wishes to commune with you know what i would call god's creation which other people would call whatever they call it but you know consciousness the zeitgeist god consciousness human consciousness you see 
in an atheistic worldview, as well as denying free will, they actually deny consciousness. So I've, I've got to say that interview that Piers Morgan did with that bloke, I just looked up the guy's called Steve Mayer, and he's just written this book. Um, what's it called? Um, what's his new book called? Uh, Okay, that doesn't even say in the description here. Anyway, it's just brought out this new book. And it says, can this man prove that God exists? Piers Morgan versus Stephen Mayer. It's a really good interview. It's quite short as well. It's only 33 minutes long. Right. Um, and. If if someone wants to think about these things it's not for me to tell anyone what to think or to believe you know i know what i feel and um, you know what's in my own heart and mind in these matters All right, let's um, i would i would recommend anyone to listen to that interview and and, and also watch the robert graves in, um never, interview. never mind about uh, Piers morgan and uh, whoever is interviewing right why do you believe that uh god a creator god exists Because I, I am in awe, a marvel at the beauty in the world, and um, I don't think it's an accident. In the same way, I don't think all the evil and wickedness in the world is an accident either. Um, and I, I believe with all of my heart in, in free will and human consciousness, um and i i believe that is part of god's gift to the world yeah so so i, uh, so I believe we have choices and that and we no, have to make those choices responsibly and in a way that honors the beauty of, of god's creation yeah yeah, yeah. so that's what, what you, i believe yeah what you're saying in a nutshell is that you look around you at the amazing, the amazing complexity and beauty of what you see, and you seek an explanation. An explanation that you favour, I haven't thought about it, is that there is a creator God. Well, actually, no, I don't. I, 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 and that part of it isn't, you know, my... My main concern is to enjoy it and make the most of the of of of, of the moment. You know, I I'm not trying to predict anything or or make claims about things that have happened. I I I I I love being and every moment of my being in this wonderful world. For all the good and all the no, bad and all the rest of it, it's a fantastic place and I'm really glad I'm here. But I was just going back to what you said earlier. That your explanation for the existence of everything you see is God. I, I do think that um, God consciousness, right? So I'm not talking about a man in the clouds with a white beard, right? I think that humanity, the world and the universe belongs and is a part of a greater consciousness, right? That actually guides the unfolding of the conscious universe what, what is, uh, I, that, that's that that's what i yeah. believe i mean i i i think it's a, it, well, it, it's an emergent yeah, thing. No, 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 no. but what does a greater consciousness mean well what it actually well um what it means is that In interacting with the world and being in the world, 
right? I'm not alone in the world. My actions affect other people. Those near and dear to me, you know, family and friends and um, actually understanding that how I act in the world and how I feel about how my actions, you know, however small, have a, an impact on how the world unfolds, brings with it a sense of awe, but a great sense of responsibility. Um, but, and yeah, a lot of that responsibility but all of that, stuff I all can't of that, know about. So, I mean, it's that, very, all it's very not, esoteric, Mike. It's not. Yeah, but you know, all, that, all of that does not ex explain why things exist. It doesn't, but it provides a code. Uh, it, it provides a code for existing in a um, in a congruent way with everything else. Yeah, I mean, um, so I, like, I do believe in the power of prayer and particularly the, the power of collective prayer, right? But, but I, I think that's a consciousness thing. Um, so who, uh, as an individual or collectively, are those praying, praying to? Well, I think people are willing, willing for good. And, and I think when people pray, the will for good in a combined consciousness, which is part of God's consciousness, makes a huge difference. I really do. It sounds like to me that um, you're postulating that um, God uh, is a concept uh, rather than a uh, uh, being. I mean, this is the it's the difference between materialism and idealism, right? But I, I think I think God is a consciousness. It's a mind, and we're all a part of that mind and ascending to you know our full conscious potential, as it were outside of our physical bodies i think we we're, we're subsumed back into that consciousness right so I, I i i'm not any sort of hard materialist i believe that material things exist but i don't think they're the most important things so um you know is nature purely a material artifact of physical stuff? I don't. I don't believe that's so. I don't think it is. Would you agree that um, particularly um, the Roman Catholic Church uh, since their inception? have uh, abused their position? Yeah, I would, I would say yes to that, um, but by no means only the, uh, not only the, uh, the, uh, the Catholic Church. I, I, I think that all political institutions in which I include churches in general are corruptible. Yeah, you know, because our material existence is informed by um, circumstances and, you know, necessities or temptations and all of these different things, you know, our, our own human weaknesses, as it were. Um, but what, you know, the the the, the aim of, of 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 life is is, is to 
um, is to try and make amends for the harm that we all inevitably do do. You know, you don't, I, 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 you know, when, when we leave our physical bodies, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a really sad thought to think that one would leave with unresolved regrets, un, unrepented sins, if you like. I mean, I, however you paint that, it's, it, it's a personal thing and it's uh, like a, a well-being, a, you know, you can say it's a mental health thing, but I, I think consciousness is, is beyond mental health. Um, it, 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 we're all part of... Well, God consciousness is actually a really good word. It sounds a little bit new age and all the rest of it. Uh, but, you know, if you don't like the God word, you know, we're all part of nature consciousness, you know, whether that's human nature or physical nature or, you know, I, I would call it God's creation. But, you know, the world, the universe, um, you know, I'm, I'm not... Yeah, I'm not offended in the slightest that people sort of say, oh, you know, that, that, that all sounds a bit new age and, you know, you're obviously mad because you believe in God or whatever. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe I am, but I'm, you know, I'm quite at ease with my own uh, perception of why I'm here, what the point is and, and you know, um, trying to steer a path, you know, uh, in, in, in an infinite yeah some would infinite. say some would say that all you need to do is to follow the golden rule being do not do to others what you wouldn't want done to yourself yeah, well, well, absolutely. Absolutely. i mean if that's the only one we had that that would work wouldn't it yeah you know i wouldn't argue with that and 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 you know i i sign up for that all day long you know um I, yeah, that makes sense to me. And I, I'm not seeking to impose, you know, if someone asks me, well, what do you believe in? What do you mean by that? I, I, I'll try my best to explain what I feel or what what I'm on about. Um, it doesn't surprise me the least if it comes across as being a bit incoherent, no one else understands, because, you know, ultimately, I don't know. I'm operating on faith that, there is a higher purpose and there is, you know, a light in the world, which it's worth steering well, towards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, However I, deluded or misguided that might be, it's a very comforting thought. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I can accept that. When I look at the word faith in the dictionary, it says to believe something when there is no evidence to support that belief. Yeah. And when you drill down, that, that applies to just about anything. You know, when you start putting boundary conditions on things, you know, the, the idea that empirical science is the only acceptable form of evidence or proves actually anything in particular. Um, that's something this Stephen Mayer guy goes into in, you know, I, I am going to get hold of his book and have a read of it. It sounds quite interesting. Yeah. You know, it occurs to me that um, um, when people, um, as they go through their life, if they find something that provides them with uh, comfort, call it comfort, uh, purpose, uh, some sort of um, uh, some sort of reasoning, uh, uh, help, whatever that might be, if it helps them get through the day, I'm, I'm all for that, you know? And different people express that in different ways. Um, you know... Um, yeah, guided by your, like, do no harm principle, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, uh, I think uh, as we talk, uh, about an art of mine in uh, Ireland who is a devout Catholic, right? never ever read the Bible, but in, in her lifetime she lost uh, her husband 
uh, who died when she had eight children and the eldest was 14. No, the eldest was 19 and the youngest was eight. Um, and in more recent times, she uh, lost a daughter to cancer. She has a second daughter who uh, was in remission, but now is uh, the cancer return and uh, should be told it's terminal. And uh, this aunt, right, being a devout Catholic, goes to Mass every day. When she comes home, uh, she puts on the Catholic radio. Uh, totally, total belief in Jesus. And I say to myself, you know, that helps her. Yeah, it provides some sort of cushion, some sort of um, something that helps her deal with uh, what she has to deal with. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, that is fine. It doesn't. It doesn't matter what the uh, what the uh, scholars say. What. Uh, an objective view of the Catholic Church might well be. If it helps her uh, to get through each day, and that's what she's chosen, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't find it offensive in any way, shape or form. I mean, I, you know, um, I, I do find it offensive when the Pope says that, you know, the WHO treaty for pandemics or whatever should be signed and, you know, everybody should get vaccinated or whatever. I mean, that's that that, that offends me. But but you know, individuals and their own personal faith. I I I, I think um, I think they're misguided if they think the Pope's infallible and if he says <laughs> drive over that cliff, drive over that cliff. I I I I, I draw the line at that. But you know, again, it's kind of still their business. But you know when um, uh, you know that quote um, that I uh, uh, previously mentioned to you um, in terms of people are not very intelligent. You know, I can interpret that in that I would say uh, the majority of people are not critical thinkers. They're not taught to be a critical thinker. I, I think that's that's, that's probably that's true. People aren't taught taught to do it. I, I mean, I, I I think people are taught not to do it, as opposed to being taught to do it. Um, and I think people have to be trained not to do it because it is a uh, it's an inherent part of of, of human yeah. um, inquisitiveness. That's yeah. part of human consciousness is is to be inquisitive you know is, is to eat of the tree of knowledge <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah i mean it's 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 one of those that the, the sort of the the counterpoint to the argument perhaps tells us more than the argument itself yeah would you uh, moving on a bit would you um would you agree that the Jew, according to the, uh, the Jewish uh, community, and you know, that is not a cohesive, harmonious group because there are many different shades of the uh, Jewish community. But those who uh, describe themselves as Jewish, and they are um, uh, a relatively uh, small part of the total population, would you agree that the Jewish community are given a special position in uh, in society? And I, I mean, no, I, 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 that's not my 
um, that's not my experience. So, um, what, how, why? I have he heard it argued. I, I, I um, but but not really ever for me convincingly. Well, why why do we have um, uh, the word anti-Semitism, which apparently is different from racism? Yeah, why? I, um, I, the the scapegoating of the court Jew is something that's gone on since medieval times, and so um, in in terms of recent history, so say you know expulsions of the Jews from different places um, now. A lot of people say, oh, well, that's the, you know, that's their fault because that's how they are. Well, I don't actually think that that's um, basically my own belief is that the Jews were used as a scapegoat to justify usury because the court Jew was able to lend money at interest, which was done for the supposedly um, anointed by God monarch and the established church within their realm supporting that um that claim as to uh you know who's chosen by god is it the jews or was it the king i i would go down that road uh, and, and unpack it from there um but, you know, I, I had said all these three which we're, we're both familiar with but i think about today right and i asked a question um if um, you know, if there is some criticism of, uh, say, um, an individual who is a Protestant or Catholic or a uh, Muslim, right? Uh, and they're part of a community, right? Um, there isn't a spec, uh, that would be described in various ways. Uh, Pretty equally, you know, could be described as, uh, you know, as racism, right? Why is it that when a criticism of the Jewish community arises, it's called anti-Semitism? Well, I, I, I haven't got an answer to that question. I, I really don't know. And um, what's behind the charge? I, I, you know, I, I, you see, my relationship with Judaism, you know, and, and, and obviously I've been in business with Jewish people for most of my adult life. Um, is quite different to someone that hasn't got an intimate connection with Judaism, right? Now, um, do I think anti-Semitism exists? Are there people that have an irrational hatred of, 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 of Jewish people and see Jewish people as a, you know, as a community, as an amorphous community? which is actually quite a quite a misguided concept of um, just to give an example of this in terms of say Catholicism I heard a thing the other day um, talking about how Polish Jews Italian Jews um, and no Polish Catholics uh, Italian Catholics and, you know, say Spanish Catholics in, in in the States all tend to go to the Polish Catholic Church or that, you know, they go to um, a church which does it in that sort of way. Well, the Jewish diaspora is kind of everywhere as well. You know, not not all Jews are Zionists. Um, 
many very religious Jews in New York, for instance, are really pissed off um, that Israel claims them as their own sort of thing. Yeah. So it's it's not this monolithic thing. We were talking about Jesus earlier and about, you know, what's all that about the money changes in the temple then? Well, of course, the Sadducees were in league with the occupying Romans and yeah, Jesus, yeah. who's a carpenter, who's a working class Jew, if you will, um, wasn't signed up to that party. So, yeah, of course, there's elitism in Judaism as well as there are in, in other other cultures. And it's a cultural thing um, which is informed by cultural mores all over the world, right? Um, so it, it, it's... Anti-Semitism, okay, well, number, you know, Semitism is, Semitic languages is not just Hebrew. No. You know, so, um, it is, uh, why isn't that anti-Muslim, say, because, you know, people really don't like Muslims, you know, some someone that doesn't like Jews is equally likely to be fairly off about Muslims as well, or maybe uh, Hindus yeah. or something. Yeah. Or Rastafarians, you know, like brown people rather than white people or something, or people with, you know, like, you know, it, it, it's it's an irrational hatred of Jewish people. And that's called that. That's what's become bracketed as anti-Semitism. Anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitism because obviously not all Zionists are Jews. In fact, many Zionists are not Jews at all. I agree. Many of them are evangelical um uh pentecostal christians so you know um so i you know i i i don't think the fact there's a word anti-semitism is the the problem the way that that is used and politicized by certain elements in judaism and i would say probably elitist elements in judaism um and elitists all over the world you know it's them and us and they are not all jews they but they are elitists and i would put all the six huxley in with them you know and you quoted him earlier so i'll say well, well i think there's quite a lot in this i don't think there is i, I think at his simple level of understanding and his world view of what a world order should be it makes perfect sense of that i just don't sign up to it i think it's a load whole, whole load of crap I guess uh, what we do agree upon is that um, the world is a hugely complex uh, situation and it's, it's very difficult, it's not impossible to try and harmonise uh, all that goes on. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I think that um, the mass of people are much e find it much easier to rub along together uh, when they don't have the burden of a parasitic elitist uh, overclass to to carry with yeah. with with their rents on the world, including usury. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, Solon said in his reforms, um, well, Plutarch wrote that that um, you know the burden of interest is 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 heavy enough even for a rich man. Uh, but to put it on the shoulders of, of a poor man, they don't stand a chance. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's about usury, that is. And it's absolutely true that, that uh, a, a commerce um, and a prosperity seeking to build itself upon usury um, is going to end in penury for the mass of the people. Um, and, you know, that's the wider context of Jesus throwing the money changers out of the temple, because if men, money lenders were there, he probably would have taken his fists to them, not yeah. merely ejected them. Yeah. Since you mentioned uh, Jesus, I'll uh, just make two further points. The story... Jesus, uh, I, I think Jesus was a Jew, you know, patently, um, but obviously not a popular Jew with the elitist um administrative and priestly class in um in jerusalem galilee where he came from at the time again you know, not trying not an right. uppity working class carpenter terrible again, chap. again not trying to be clever but a uh, question to you why is he called jesus 
search me. I mean, <laughs> that, 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 that's the name in the book, in the Bible. That's what they call him, isn't it? I mean, I, I, um, I don't know what the Hebrew name for Jesus is. Right. OK. Yeah. Or, or, or the Aramaic name for Jesus, even. Uh, right. Um, not trying to be clever with that. But his birth name uh, is Yeshua. And a direct translation of uh, Yeshua is Joshua. Yeshua in Hebrew, right, because uh, in the area where the Bible says uh, Jesus operated, Galilee and Judea, uh, the written and spoken word was primarily Aramaic, but also some uh, Hebrew. The thing is that the um, the Old Testament, uh, sorry, the New Testament, uh, the original documentation was written in um, Greek. The there is no direct um, there is no direct translation or, or similar name for Yeshua in Greek. Yeshua means saviour in Hebrew. The equivalent of saviour in Greek is Jesus. And that's why um, he's referred to as Jesus. This is an interesting question. So with all the linguistic stuff back and forth and all the rest of it, what, what what's the Aramaic, Greek and Latin for Messiah? Christos. Christos is is is, is Messiah, is it? OK. And, and Jesus is saviour. Right. Yeah. So that's why it's sometimes referred to as uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, because Christ is the Greek of Christos. Right. Right. Cool. Look, my, I, I, I've got to go to the loo and, and have my lunch now. So that's been a very, <laughs> as ever, enlightening discussion. We will talk again, Rog. We will indeed. Let's do that soon. OK, take care. Cheers, mate. Take care of yourself. Cheers. Bye.